Ja, ganz schön schief. Schief und so. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, see uh, people still arriving. Uh, so, we shall uh, resume. Uh, so, just to recall what uh, we did yesterday, we started to check the list here. Uh, so, we had computed. Uh, well, I, I just recall also that what I call omega gn. Uh, of Z1, Zn is uh, the Wgn, but I multiply by the differential dx1, dxn. This is a tensor product. This is a symmetric n form. On, uh, so it's a symmetric n form on the nth power of the curve. Uh, on, on, we express it in terms of a variable living on the Riemann surface rather than the x variables. If you want, in the x variable, this, this is multi-valued, but in the surface, this is mono-valued. This is really a, this is a function of a point on the surface. Uh, and in this language, omega 0, 1 is just y dx, omega 0, 2 is b. And yesterday, I showed you the computation w11. Let's say it's done. So uh, now let's continue. And uh, yes, and I also introduced this kernel that uh, arises in a computation of, of omega 1 1. And let me recall the result. Omega 1 1 of z was just the residue at z prime equals plus or minus 1 of k of z z prime times b of z prime uh, 1 over z prime. Uh, remark that in this curve, we have this involution uh, sigma. Sigma of z equals 1 over z. It's an involution. And it has the property that x of sigma of z equals x of z. So it's the Galois involution that uh, exchanges the roots of uh, the solution of, of x of z equals a given x. Um, and it has on the fixed point, the fixed points of this involution are precisely the ramification points. Basically, that's where the two sheets meet. I mean, that's almost the definition. Sigma is the involution that exchanges the two sheets. And of course, fixed points are the intersections of the two sheets. All right. So here, so it's just I'm preparing the generalization later. Plus or minus one are these ramification points, the, the fixed point of the involution. And here you see the, um, the sigma appearing also. Well, and if you remember, the trick to prove this result was to uh, write the Cauchy residue formula. And in the right hand side, replace omega 1, 1 uh, in the integral by what we know from the loop equation. And miraculously, this term uh, P11, this unknown polynomial P11 that was so painful to compute, does not contribute to the residue. So we don't even have to compute it, and uh, we find this formula. Uh, the same trick will work in general. So let me uh, do the example. No. Well, let, let me go more, uh, somehow to a general case. So let's compute an omega gn of, I will put uh, aside the variable z1, it will play a special role, z2, zn. So z1, so I will, I will work with, I will give a special role to variable z1, and basically I'm going to write the Cauchy residue the theorem. Uh, I'm just going to say that this is the residue when z prime goes to z1 of uh, so dz prime over z prime minus z1 of omega gn of z prime z2 zn 
this is, this is a differential form. Somehow it already contains the dz prime. Uh, so I don't have to divide, sorry. So it already contains the dz prime, but this one uh, is a dz, uh, contains the dz1. So let me put the dz1 here. Right. Uh, in fact, let me recall the z prime. Let me recall it z. Okay, it will be easier to write. Uh, okay, so this is just Cauchy formula. This is true for any rational fraction. Now, uh, from the loop equations, you can convince yourself that omega g n, uh, in the, for most values of g on n, except, uh, except 0, 2, and 0, 1, uh, but all the others, for example, it was the case of omega 1, 1, all the others can have poles only at ramification points. Uh, it follows from the loop equations, it follows from general principles. Uh, uh, I mean, just as by studying the structure of singularities, you will see that this can have poles only, uh, poles only at z equals plus or minus 1. So then, same thing, minus residue z goes to plus or minus 1, dz1 over z minus z1, omega gn of z, z2, zn. Okay, so now we have to use the loop equations. So what were the general loop equations? So I recall the loop equations. The loop equations for a general, so let me rewrite them in terms of WG. So yesterday I wrote them in terms of WGNs. I will then multiply by the differentials, but uh, let me rewrite what we had. We had that uh, W G minus one N plus one of, so it was written this way yesterday, X two, xn uh, plus sum g1 plus g2 equals g and let me write it this, this way i1 i2 equals x2 xn so i split the n minus 1 variables x2 up to xn into two subsets two complementary subsets okay and uh, w g1 1 plus cardinal of i1 of x i1 w g2 1 plus cardinal of i2 x i2 uh, plus sum from j equals 2 to n d over d x j of w g n minus one of x x two uh, so x j x n minus w g n minus one of x two x n divided by x minus x j equals this pgn of x, x2, xn, and which is a polynomial, polynomial in the variable x. So this is the loop equation we had yesterday. In fact, yesterday I wrote the equations with the w hats. Okay. And uh, I told you, you can do as an exercise to write it for the cumulants. This is what you get. Basically, this sum is just the decomposition of the full, uh, uh, the full expectation value into sums of cumulants. And, we already, and I already subtracted all the equations that we have already solved before. So I keep only the terms that we, we need here. Uh, yes. So this is the equation that we need. Uh, now we should rewrite it in terms of the omega gns. 
Okay, so if you rewrite it in terms of the omega GNs, you multiply by dx2 dxn. That's so dx2 dxn. So here you have times dx2. Well, you see that dx2 dxn are exactly what we need to do all the variables in i1 on i2. And I will also have to multiply by dx to the square. And one of the dx, I will put it here. One, the other one, I will put it there. Here also, I multiply by, uh, by dx2 dxn. Let me put aside the dxj. Let me not put it here. And the dxj, let me put it here. So then you see that dxj, d over dxj is the differential with respect to the j variable. So I will rewrite all this as d uh, index j. Okay. Uh, right. And here, well, we multiply this by dx squared dx2 dxn. So this is a polynomial in x times dx squared dx2 dxn. This is called, uh, well, this is a quadratic differential in terms of x. Uh, by the way, it's typically the kind of quadratic differentials you find in Hitchin systems. I mean, it is uh, not just the kind, it is. Right. Uh, right, so, uh, okay, so we are almost done. This becomes, so, uh, however, we have this general property that, um, okay. The WGNs uh, are multi-valued in terms of x. So when we go to the, to, to the z variables, uh, we have uh, so somehow we have to choose one, uh, one uh, to make a choice of square root. And here the x variable appears twice. And also another thing is that the, the WGNs for most values of g on n uh, are odd under the change of sheet, except W02. W02, you can see here, it's not odd under the change of cheat. It has the property that B Z1 Z2 plus B of 1 over Z1 Z2 equals dx1 dx2 over x1 minus x2 to the square. So you see under the change of sheet, there is an additional term. Uh, so, now I will replace this by the variables omega, uh, so by variable z, z, and here I will put 1 over z, but this means I need to change the sign, because I told you replacing, so changing z to 1 over z uh, changes the sign of omega, for except if this were an omega 0 to. So you have to be careful when this is an omega zero two. So now this is included in the definition of the omega. Here as well, I will put omega g1 z, and here it's the variable z to zn. Uh, here I will put a one over z i2. And again, that puts a minus sign because I change one of the omegas, right? Uh, here, uh, here there are some subtleties. Well, and, okay, and again, I could change the sign, put a minus here, except when there was an omega zero two. So you should put aside the terms with omega zero two and you will see that they will combine nicely. In fact, the terms with omega zero two combine nicely with this one, and basically they are going to kill that one. Just believe me, this is an exercise to do. But uh, the change of sign that I put here, uh, I mean the, the involution that I put here, for omega zero two, it gives an extra term, and this extra term is a derivative, and it combines nicely just to kill that term. Let me put a minus sign here. 
let me put a minus sign here. So here, uh, this one was precisely omega g n minus 1. So this was precisely omega g n minus 1 of z2 zn. Uh, this has already been taken into account. We still have the dx square, and yes, that's it. Uh, yes, that's it. Yeah, okay, that's it. Uh, yeah, so now this is what I'm going to use. Uh, let us, uh, okay. Uh, we proceed, uh, okay, let us assume, this is the recursion hypothesis, we have already computed all the omega g prime n prime with uh, 2g prime minus 2 plus n prime strictly lower than 2g minus 2 plus n. So if you want, now we want to compute omega g n and we assume that we have already computed all those with lower value of this index. Okay, uh, so for example, when we computed the omega 1, 1, uh, this was omega 1, 1, this was worth 1. So which, which, which means we should, we, we assume that we had all computed all the ones with uh, 2g prime minus 2 plus n prime strictly lower than 1 and basically this is only omega 0 1 and omega 0 2 which indeed we had already computed. Uh, for example if you want to compute uh, just if we would like to compute omega 0 4 to compute omega 0 4 we need everything with uh, with this value strictly lower than uh, 1 again uh, no, sorry, than 2, strictly lower than 2, which means we, need, we could need, for example, omega 1, 1, or we could need omega 0, 3. We have not yet computed omega 0, 3. But uh, and to compute omega 0, 3, you realize that you need only omega 0, 1 and omega 0, 2. I spare you the computation of omega 0, 3. We can do it. Uh, and I'm just going to the general case. So we assume that we have already computed those with lower Euler characteristic. Which is why it's called the topological. Uh, that's why this recursion is called topological. If you think of that as an Euler characteristic, you proceed by recursion on the Euler characteristic. So, so then let's write this equation. In this equation, uh, omega g n appears somewhere, and you can convince yourself that. Uh, well, so if you take g on n, omega g n appears somewhere. Uh, but all the other omega g1, uh, 1 plus i1, or g minus 1, n plus 1, have strictly lower Euler characteristics. So we shall put them as the known part. So let's put aside the... Um, uh, let's put aside the... So in this big sum, somewhere, there is the term with g1 is equal g, g2 equals 0, and I1 being the full set, and I2 being the empty set. So in this sum, there is uh, one term is minus omega 0, 1 of z. Uh, no, okay, sorry. Minus omega g n of z, z2, zn, times omega 0, 1 of 1 over z. minus uh, omega, and there is another term where omega gn appears, it's the, the, it's the omega 0, 1 z, omega gn of 1 over z, z2, zn. Okay? This is... Uh, well... Sorry, I realized that I was a little bit wrong. So there is also, uh, sorry, omega zero one also uh, has uh, is not odd, but remember it was 
v prime of x of z times dx. Well, it was v prime of x dx. And in the loop equation, I thought, so initially there was a minus v prime omega g n. But basically changing this change, uh, the, uh, it's like the omega zero two term. Uh, it, it's completely absorbed by that, so it disappears. So this one, this one is correct. What I wrote before was not correct. <laughs> I mean, because I forgot that term uh, in the loop equation, and I forgot the fact that omega zero one was not odd. But now this one is the correct one, I promise. And this one is kind of universal. Uh, I mean, it would be true for almost any, uh, any spectral curve. Just replace 1 over z by sigma of z. So now, so there are these two terms in the equation. Uh, and let's put everything else in the right hand side. Because our unknown is omega gn. And in the right hand side, we shall have, for example, we shall have this term, omega g minus 1 and plus 1 of z, 1 over z, z2, zn, plus sum over uh, g1 plus g2 equal g, i1, i2 equal z2, zn, omega g1, 1 plus i1, uh, z i1, omega g2, 1 plus i2, 1 over z i2. But now we have removed, so in this sum, we, have, we, we should not take the terms that are in the left hand side. So we want no, let me write it this way, no um, 0, 1. Because the terms with an omega zero one are here, or no gn, this is equivalent. Okay. Uh, so in, in fact, very often we call it no disk, but we can still have cylinders. Omega zero two are loads in this sum, right? Um, then uh, we also have in the right hand side plus sum of our j, dj of omega g n minus 1 z2 zn over x minus xj times dx to the square plus pgn uh, dx to the square. So this is the right hand side of the loop equa of, uh, of our equation. So this is the right hand side of our loop equation. Just let me recall that for generic g on n, so if gn is not 0, 1 or 0, 2, this is an odd function. So I can replace that by a z and put a plus. Right? So I didn't want to erase that. Okay, I can. No, this is where we were. Okay, so we need to, to write it. Well, okay, I should not, I mean, I will start again from there. So omega, remember, omega gn of z1, zn was minus residue z goes to plus or minus 1 of dz1 over z minus z1 uh, times omega gn of z1 of z z2 zn which appears there and there and uh, you see that I will so I will replace it by the right hand side divided by omega 0 1 of z minus omega 0 1 of 1 over z so it would be 1 over omega 0 1 of z minus omega zero one of one over z times, and in the right hand side, we have basically everything here, omega g minus one and plus one, z one over z, z two, z n, plus sum with no disks, omega g one, one plus i one, 
By the way, the, the second index in the omega gn is always the same as the number of variables we have inside. Uh, plus some over j dj uh, omega g minus one uh, g n minus one z two z n over x minus x j uh, times the x square plus p g n the x square. Sorry? Uh, in the term where yes, so there is the J inside. No, 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 you don't. No, the term where we skip the ZJ was killed by the symmetrizing the omega zero two. No, no, in fact, the one you skip is dead. The one you skip is dead. Z is no more there. And this is very important. And I'm, this is exactly what I was going to say now. Since Z does not appear there, Z basically appears only in X on the X square. But uh, this means that this term has no pole at the ramification point. And this is crucial. So if you had Z inside, there would be a pole at the ramification point, uh, possibly. So. Uh, here you have, a, so here this was, uh, this x is gamma z plus one over z, and this term, it has a pole, so this term has a pole when x equals xj, but it does not have a pole at z equals plus or minus one. It doesn't. Uh, same thing, this term does not have a pole at x equals, uh, at uh, z equals plus or minus one. So basically what this means is that these two terms don't contribute to the residue. Again, you don't have to compute PGN. Uh, there is no need to compute PGN. You know that it will not contribute to the residue, so it does not matter at all. By the way, uh, in, in the generalization of topological, so in, in, in matrix models in loop equations, PGN was a polynomial, and for a long time people thought it was important that it is a polynomial. In fact, you see that what matters in the end is just that it has no pole at ramification points, so which is a much uh, uh, which is a less strong condition. Uh, and so it, when we realize that, it allowed to, to solve uh, many more matrix models, for example. Uh, right, so, uh, but so we have arrived to the final formula. So let me just erase that. And this is the topological recursion formula. This is really now the almost definition of CR. Uh, again, let me rewrite this in term of a kernel. Well, so let me put the minus inside and let me call this K of Z1Z. It's the same as before. Uh, okay, I mean, we, we can anti-symmetrize again because we know that omega gn is an odd function of Z1. So we could anti-symmetrize and it gives you the same K I've written here. Right, so this is the, well, let's say this is the topological recursion formula. And it works for every g on n such that 2g minus 2 plus n is strictly positive. This formula is valid in both cases. But the only ones for which uh, this quantity is negative would be 0, 1, and 0, 2 that we already know, or, or basically that are given uh, as the initial data. Omega 0, 1, omega 0, 2, they are the initial data. And once you have the initial data, omega 0, 1, and omega 0, 2, you compute k. And this formula computes all the others by recursion. Uh, now, let me go to. Uh, some general properties of okay. general properties of topological recursion on how to generalize this formula. So this formula, I derived it for matrix models. I derived it in the case with 
genus zero spectral curve. In fact, it is completely general. There is a There are a few subtleties when you want to generalize. Uh, for, first, for non genus zero spectral curves, you see that uh, K contains an integral of a differential form. Uh, if you are not on a genus zero curve, an integral uh, could have monodromies on the surface. It could be uh, not defined. I mean, uh, basically, uh, the value of, in terms of the z variable could depend on which path you have chosen to integrate. So it's not really a function on the surface. Uh, it, is, uh, it is an abelian differential. So which means that the, the property that I used here, that the sum of all residue b0 might not be true on a higher genus surface. However, there is a formula. So whenever you have such kind of uh, abelian differential, there is a formula to move the integration contour, which is called the Riemann bilinear identity. And you have to take into account the sum of, uh, the sum of integrals around all possible non-contractible cycles. Uh, so you have to use that. I will not do it here, but you have to use that. And you can prove that this formula is still the correct one. But, uh, but you have to work. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's less trivial than just saying the sum of all residues is zero. It turns out that somehow it's true, but you have to prove that it is true. Uh, so this formula continues to hold uh, in, uh, in general. So now let me go to the, uh, I think it's four, the, so topological recursion. So, uh, the first part is that, so the initial data is a spectral curve. And so the idea is, you see that in this formula that we derived from matrix models, uh, all what we need to do to, to know is an omega zero one and an omega zero two. This defines a K. And this formula defines a sequence of omega gn. And somehow, uh, we don't have to know it came from a matrix model. We, we just need to have chosen some omega 0, 1 and some omega 0, 2, and we can apply the formula. Does it give something interesting to do that? And the answer is yes. Uh, so, uh, so in general, we, we so choose an arbitrary spectral curve. What I mean by arbitrary, what I mean by a spectral curve, let me call it S. So it's the data of uh, basically a Riemann surface, uh, sigma. Here it was the complex plane, or uh, in the genus 1 case, it was a torus, or in the genus 2. I mean, it, it could have been a, a Riemann surface of an arbitrary genus. There is a function x from that surface to, uh, let's say, CP1, because here x is really now a complex variable. In fact, you can generalize that to, uh, instead of CP1, you could replace by sigma zero, uh, that I would call a base curve. This just needs to be one Riemann surface. Uh, in most applications, we choose CP1, but uh, basically in hitching systems, you want to choose, uh, to choose another one. Uh, then we have this omega zero one, which is a one form, a uh, meromorphic one form on sigma. And you want to choose an omega zero two, which I call B, uh, which is a one tensor one form on sigma square, uh, it must be symmetric and it must have a double pole on the diagonal. No, no, it does not have to be compact. Uh, in fact, what you need is that X, uh, X is a branch cover. Uh, 
And we shall assume that we, we, it, it has finitely many, uh, finite number of ramification points. All the formalism can be enlarged with uh, infinite numbers, but it's definitely, uh, well, I mean, it, it's not really completed uh, at the moment, but, uh, but so the, the surface does not have to be compact, but this requirement of a finite number of ramification points is really the, the thing that you need. In fact, uh, omega zero one, uh, does not really need to be meromorphic one form. A germ of a one form locally at ramification points will be enough. This can be re uh, replaced by germs uh, at ramification points. I mean, many of these uh, hypotheses can be can be lifted to to get an even more general formalism. Uh, so I said that B has double pole on the diagonal. It could have poles somewhere else as well. Uh, basically, we just want no pole at ramification points. But it could have some poles uh, in other places that would not matter too much. Uh, but the pole at the, at the diagonal is essential. And we, we want that. B behaves at the, on the diagonal at dz1, dz2 over z1 minus z2 to the square plus holomorphic on the diagonal near z1 goes to z2. Okay. Uh, uh, let me assume. Uh, simple ramification points. Which means that locally near a ramification point, uh, the map X from sigma to, uh, from a neighborhood, uh, let's say, locally in, um, so, neighborhood, uh, if you take a neighborhood U of a ramification point, uh, X restricted to U, uh, so, sorry, from sigma, sigma uh, to sigma zero, uh, you want it to be a uh, two to one. Locally, X is two to one. So, which means that locally at a uh, you, you assume that at a ramification point, there are exactly two sheets meeting, not three sheets, not four sheets, and so on. Uh, so, this is a kind of generic situation. I mean, if you require that there are more than two sheets meeting at the same time, it's a non generic condition. You have to, to fine tune your parameters, you have to choose precisely the values of T4 and so on, uh, so that this will happen. But for generic values of T4, this will not, uh, every ramification points are simple. In fact, I'm going, so in fact, this formula is the formula for simple ramification points. Uh, there is a formula also for non-simple ramification points. It is out of, uh, of the reach of this lecture, but maybe some people will talk about it. Maybe, you know, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, okay. Uh, so this can be generalized if the ramification points are not simple, but let me simplify by assuming all ramification points are simple. So which means that locally, locally uh, near a ramification point, let's, let's call it A, near A, there exists an involution sigma A that exchanges the two sheets. Uh, So let me illustrate this by just an example, x equals z3 minus, uh, minus 3z, uh, on let's say y equals z, something like that, 
what would the, so if you plot in the x, y, uh, if you plot it this way, uh, you have uh, you have a degree three curve. Uh, you see that basically y cube minus three y equals x, and uh, and it looks like that. Okay, but so you have two ramification points, but each of them is simple. So uh, so for instance, if you call this one a1 and this one a2, here sigma a1 is the map that exchange these two sheets, while sigma a2 is the map that exchange these two sheets. So um, the topological recursion formula will be the same as here. So then you have your spectral curve. not have erased that. Okay. Then uh, topological recursion. So this is the definition. Uh, let's call it the invariant of your spectral curve S. So this is the definition. Define omega zero one while well, it's the one given by the spectral curve. Omega zero two is this b, and then, and uh, for every g n such that two g minus two plus n positive, uh, define omega g n of z one z n. So now the z i belong to the to sigma surface sigma equals sum over all ramification points. residue when z goes to a of the kernel that I will call k. Let me call it ka of z1z. And here you just replace by sigma a of z and sigma a of z. And where ka of sigma ka of z1z is one half integral from sigma a of z uh, to sigma a, so, sorry, to z. Omega 0, 2 of z1 uh, and the dot means the variable that you integrate over omega 0, 1 of z minus uh, well, I can write omega zero one of one over z, but the correct notation would be the pullback by sigma a uh, of omega zero one. Uh, so, okay, let me write it omega zero one evaluated at, at sigma a of z. Yeah, that's it. Uh, Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so just here, uh, the integration path between the two is uh, so you integrate. So you so in fact we shall use this formula only if z only to compute a residue as z goes to a. So we shall use this formula only if z is in a small neighborhood of uh, of a. So we can always choose uh, a simply connected, I mean, a small disk around A, and we choose the unique uh, homology path that stays in this neighborhood. So this is not ambiguous. But this can, but it also means that as a function of Z, it cannot be analytically continued outside of a small neighborhood of A. I mean, it's defined only locally in a small neighborhood of A. Usually, people find something really strange with that formula is that there is a, a one form in the denominator. So in terms of z, it is like a 1 over dz. And it's kind of unusual to have a 1 over dz. But remember that here we have a quadratic differential. We have a dz on the dz. So we, have, so we multiply a 1 over dz by a dz squared. So in fact, uh, 
the thing that appears in this residue is the honest one form. Uh, yes. So this is the definition. So I mean, you give me a spectral curve S. You can, in fact, uh, for example, in genus zero, there are many now uh, Mathematica uh, uh, kind of softwares that have been written by various people. Uh, I think the one initiated by Vincent Bouchard is very starts to be used by a lot of people now. But there are, I'm sure, many others. At least there is mine, but they are not uh, public. I don't know. But uh, but I'm sure there are plenty of others. Uh, and you just basically you just press the button and uh, and that computes the omega gns. Well, it can be it's maybe not so fast, but it works. And, and just you don't have to think. You just press the button and it computes the omega gn. But uh, what why is this interesting? So I showed you that in a random matrix, this indeed computes the asymptotic expansion of correlation functions of uh, random matrices. But the, the interesting thing is that there are plenty of other applications. Uh, it's, it's not only random matrices. And let me uh, give a few of them. Well, for, first also, be, be, before giving applications, there is some remark that you see Z1 seems to play a special role in the formula. Uh, there, there seems to be no reason why you will get something uh, that is symmetric in terms of all the variables. So you see, I give a special role to Z1. Z1 is here. Z2, Zn, uh, the formula is clearly symmetric when you exchange Z2, Z3, Z4, and so on. But there is no, uh, it's not clear at all that this formula will, uh, that in this formula, uh, the result will be symmetric when, for example, you exchange Z1 on Z2. It's not obvious at all when you look at the formula. Uh, however, it is possible to prove by recursion, of course, because it's a recursion, it's possible to prove by recursion that indeed uh, the result is symmetric. Uh, so it's an important property. So properties. So, uh, so it's theorems. Uh, that were mostly done in our paper with Oranta in 2007. Uh, so first, omega gn is symmetric in Z1, Zn. Another thing is that Omega Gn for uh, 2G minus 2 plus N positive. Uh, in fact, when they are positive, we call that stable. So the stable Omega Gns are basically all the Omega Gns except Omega 0, 1 and Omega 0, 2. So the stable Omega Gns have poles. Uh, they are, so they are are differential forms uh, n, well, tensor n forms on sigma n with poles only at uh, zi equals ramification points. Well, technically, I could write this it's this way. Omega Gn belongs to H0 of sigma n, uh, k sigma tensor n times of the ramification locus at any degree. Okay. Twisted by the locus of ramification points. Uh, with poles are of arbitrary degrees. Uh, and the box tensor means that it is a uh, one form, uh, so it refers to the fact that it is one form in the first variable, tensor one form in the second variable, tensor one form in the third variable. I mean, on the first copy of the curve, 
tensor one form on the second copy of a curve, tensor one form on the third copy of a curve. I mean, this is the, the way to write, to write it. Uh, and another property is that uh, the residues uh, vanishing residues at ramification points. So the residue at the ramification and the ramification points is always zero. So you can have poles of degree two, three, four, and so on, but the coefficient of a simple pole must be zero. Uh, what, so I will state more properties at some point. Well, first, the symmetry, the proof is not so difficult, but it's not so trivial either, uh, and you have to prove it by recursion. Uh, first thing is to convince yourself that omega zero three is symmetric, then uh, you will somehow guess the general proof. Um, the second property, on the other hand, the fact that there are poles only at ramification points is rather trivial. And the reason is that whenever none of the zi is a ramification point here, uh, this residue takes a finite value, so it's, uh, it's well defined, so basically nothing happens when, uh, when none of the zi is a ramification point. But for, for example, if z1 would be equal to a, uh, if, uh, so you see that here, when we take residue, it means we take a small circle around A. K has a pole at Z equals Z1. So if Z1 is here, K has a pole at Z1, and Z is integrated uh, uh, along this circle. When Z1 approaches A, you pinch the integration contour. You cannot define the residue anymore. Uh, so this means that something explodes. And basically, that's the only places where omega gn could possibly uh, be not finite. And indeed, you can check, but indeed, they are not finite, they have poles. So this second property was a kind of trivial. Uh, vanishing residues, in fact, in the Z1 variable, K has a vanishing residue, so it's kind of trivial as well. Um, okay, well, it's, it's not a very difficult property to prove. So I will not prove this property. Uh, let me give some examples. So for other examples. And one very interesting example to take is the following. S, so sigma will be C or CP1, that does not really matter. Sigma zero will be CP1. Well, let's say CP1. X is the map uh, that sends CP1 to CP1, but that sends Z to Z square. So if you want X of Z equals Z square. And let me put Y of Z equals Z. And so omega zero one, which is one, which is Y dx. So first you compute dx, it is two Z dz. Uh, the only ramification point uh, is ramification point it's the place where uh, so yeah, when, uh, the, ramification, the unique ramification point is a equals zero and it is a zero of dx uh, omega zero one is y dx so it is two z square dz by the way it is the differential of two third of z cube And let's take B, uh, Z1, Z2, our DZ1, DZ2 over Z1 minus Z2 to the square. So I choose the Berman kernel of CP1. I don't have to. I could choose something else, but let's choose the, the Berman kernel of CP1. Uh, the only thing that, that I required was double pole on the diagonal, uh, symmetric. And I could possibly add something else, but I will not. Uh, let's take this simple example. So, and let's compute. Let's do an example of computation. Uh, omega one one of z one with my formula is residue 
Oh, what is the, okay, and by the way, what is the involution? The involution is sigma of z equals minus z. So residue at zero. Uh, well, no, let's first, sorry, let's first compute k. k of z1z equals, uh, so equals one half of integral from minus z to z of dz1 dz prime over z1 minus z prime to the square uh, over omega 0 1 of z which i've written here minus omega 0 1 of minus z but uh, it's clearly odd under z to minus z so it will be 4 z square dz okay uh, let's compute the integral in the numerator. It is 1 over z1, so it is, there is a dz1 over, over 8 z squared dz times uh, 1 over z1 minus z minus 1 over z1 plus z, uh, which is worth uh, 2z over z1 square minus z square. So in the end, this is dz1 over z1 over 4 z1 square minus z square uh, times 1 over z dz. It has a simple pole at z equals 0 at the ramification point. In fact, it's general. Uh, I mean, in general, this has a simple pole uh, at the ramification point. Uh, no, sorry. It has a simple pole if omega 0, 1 uh, has a simple 0. No, sorry, has, uh, has at most a double 0. Because the numerator vanishes also at the ramification point. You see this was this constellation of a 2z with z squared. But generically, for generic curves, it has a simple pole. Let us assume that. Right? So let's compute with this omega 1, 1 of z1. So it's the residue at 0 of k of z1, z. And what is this big thing in the formula? Uh, here we have g equals 1, n equals 1. So here, this g minus 1 would be a 0, n plus 1 would be a 2. So we have an um, omega 0, 2 of z and, and minus z. Plus, and what is this sum here? We must have g1 plus g2 equal g, and i1, i2 must be uh, z2, zn. Uh, so here we want to have g1 plus g2 equals 1 and i1 plus i2 must be equal to 1 because we have only z, uh, sorry, must be equal to 0, sorry. Well, basically i1 and i2, uh, i1, i2 is the empty set. So it means that i1 equals 0 equals the empty set, i2 equals the empty set. And uh, you see that since g1 plus g2 must be equal to 1, at least one of the two, either g1 or g2, must be 0. And, uh, and so if it is g1 that is 0, here we have an omega 0, 1. If it is g2 that is 0, we have an omega 0, 1. So in fact, the disk condition, the no disk, means that uh, there is no such term. The no disk condition kills all the terms there. So this is on. Uh, uh, the only thing we had, and we reset, but this is exactly what we have for the matrix model. Let's compute it in details. Let me do the computation uh, in details. It's very useful. How much time left? Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, omega 1, 1 of Z1, it's very useful to do this kind of computation one in, uh, at least once in your, in your life if you are interested in this domain. But uh, so I said you can press the button on Mathematica, but it's very good to have done it by hand at least once for omega 1, 1, omega 0, 3, and maybe omega 0, 4. Uh, it's very useful to have done it by hand at least once. So let me do it here in front of you. Uh, and I, I encourage you to do exercises to do it with your favorite spectral curves to compute omega 1, 1, omega 0, 3 uh, by hand. We can even play with higher genus spectral curves, genus 1. You will have to manipulate uh, via stress functions, theta functions, uh, things like that, but the computation is doable. Uh, you can even start playing with higher genus if you like. Uh, okay. Um, so let's replace. So K was dz1, so residue when z goes to A to 0. Well, the dz1, I can put it in front, even the dz1 over 4. Uh, so 1 over z1 minus z2 minus z, z1 square minus z square. Uh, 1 over z dz. Uh, and omega 0, 2 of z on minus z. Uh, I erased it, but I recall that it was dz times minus dz divided by z minus minus dz, so z plus z to the square. So this is 4, this is 4z square. So that's equal to 4z square. There is a minus sign, so it's a minus dz1 over 16, this is 4. Residue z goes to 0 of 1 over, and let me be subtle, let me write this as 1 over z1 square times 1 minus z square over z1 square to the power minus 1. And you see that we have dz times dz over dz, that's a dz. Uh, over z cube. Okay. Minus dz1 over 16. Residue when z goes to 0. 1 over, so let me put the z1 square here. And this 1 minus z square over z1 square plus, let me write it 1 z square plus z1 square plus z4 z1, 4, plus, and so on, dz over z cube. And the residue will extract only that term. So the residue will extract the quotient of 1 over z, so that means this term. So this is minus dz1 over 16 z1, 4. So this is omega 1, 1. Well, okay, this is omega 1. <laughs> what does it tell you? Uh, in fact, uh, let me write it this way. Uh, minus uh, d of 1 over z1 cube. Sorry. And uh, let's write it now. 1 of, of, and then the coefficient is 1 over 24. Okay, 1 over 24 is the uh, integral of the moduli space m11 of, of um, tau 1 class. Well, of a churn, well, it's the churn churn class. Okay, so I don't know how much you know about intersection numbers. Uh, probably some of you know, and they recognize this formula, which is very famous. Uh, if you don't know, I just can tell you, okay, this is the module space of, of Riemann surfaces of genus 1 with one marked point. This is the churn class of the cotangent light bundle at the marked point. Uh, and the integral of our module space gives a number, it's called the intersection number, and it's worth 1 over 24. 
In fact, it is a general result. This spectral curve, which I have erased, the spectral curve, which so our spectral curve S, which was x equals z square, y equals z, and b equals dz1, dz2 over z1 minus z2 to the square. Uh, this spectral curve will, I mean, the invariant, so the omega g ends of, of the spectral curve, will be generating functions for all the intersection numbers. Uh, the general formula, and this is, uh, this is a theorem, this is proved, uh, is 2 to the power 2 minus 2g minus n, uh, sum over d1 plus, plus dn equals 3g minus 3 plus n, uh, integral over mgn bar of tau d1 tau dn, uh, product from i equals 1 to n of 2di plus 1 double factorial, well, let me put a minus 1 to the n, uh, dzi over zi to the 2di plus 2. So you see that omega gns uh, are polynomial, well, are dzi's times a polynomial of one over the zi squares. And the coefficient of this polynomial are the intersection numbers. Can you give, can you give a reference for this? Well, in fact, it was, uh, so I'm, in fact, the proof that we had in the paper with Orantin in 2007 is a little bit heuristic, or, or maybe it relies on many other things. Uh, the, I mean, I'm not sure where we can say that the first really totally complete proof was done. I probably Moulassé. Uh, uh, okay, what is uh, okay with the same level of rigor of what Konsevich did in his paper of '91? Uh, this is done, for example, in my book. Uh, but uh, but the issue is that there was a small hole in the proof at that time. So which means uh, that uh, so basically. What I do in my book is I prove that this, this is the generating function of treble graphs. But now the fact that treble graphs are really computing the intersection numbers, the, the proof by Kontsevich had a small hole, and it was completed later. Uh, but, here, but basically, uh, in our works, what we've done is the proof that this is the generating function for, for treble graphs. Uh, but I think that there is... Um, okay. Uh, I'm not really sure what to cite as the first actual proof of that. Uh, but now there are plenty of proofs. There are many ways this is proved. Uh, another one is to use uh, Virazo constraints, uh, which again, I'm not sure where they are really proved for the first time. Maybe some people know. Uh, but in fact, I think that maybe this was used to prove uh, Virazo constraints. <laughs> okay. Uh, so basically, what we do in with Oranta is we prove that this is this is the, basically the solution of a matrix model corresponding to the Kontsevich matrix integral. And again, this to to re say that this matrix model is actually computing the intersection numbers. There, there is something to do. Right. So, but this is just an example. But just computing these numbers is very easy. I mean, with this formula, it's very, very easy. Uh, or if you want, the topological recursion formula, it's easy to prove, is equivalent to the, um, to the cut and join equation for the intersection numbers. So that's kind of trivial. I mean, just, uh, just you write this, uh, you put this in the recursion, and you find the cut and join equations. Or vice versa, if you start from cut and join, you find this... Uh, you, I mean, from cut and join, you can derive uh, topological recursion. So this is equivalent to cut and join. So if you are able to put to prove cut and join for the intersection numbers, you have topological recursion immediately and vice versa. And 
basically, uh, the cut and join equations can be understood as cut equations for the for the ribbon for the scribble graphs. Uh, and basically, this is how I do the proof. Uh, okay. Uh, let's go to. Um, so this was. Uh, what was my numbering now? Was it number three or number four? Number four, so now let me go to number five. Number five, uh, graphical representation. Uh, well, this is just, uh, so, as in just a simple notation, uh, so graphical notations. So it just instead of remembering the formula that is here, you shall remember a picture, and it makes things much easier. So the idea is that uh, as a notation, I will represent omega g n, like. Okay, I will give you two uh, alternative ways of representation, which one that will be two-dimensional, one that will be three-dimensional somehow. The three-dimensional, I already started to, to tell you what it was. So you, you so and Z1, Z2, Zn. So you just represent omega Gn as a kind of blob surface of G and G with n boundaries uh, labeled by the variable Z1, Zn. It's just a picture. It's nothing more. Uh, or you can also represent it by something like that. So it's, uh, it's more of a two-dimensional version. Oh, and another thing, since it is symmetric in the variable, there is no reason to put Z1 on the left and Z2 and so on to the right, uh, except that, uh, I mean, Everything is invariant by uh, exchanging the legs in whichever order you like, uh, but uh, it will. Um, I like to do that. <laughs> and omega zero two in the, so omega zero one in this picture would be just something like that or some uh, disk. I mean, in three dimension, and omega zero two would be something like that, or uh, would be uh, a cylinder. Omega zero two is the cylinder. I already told you that I like to represent K of Z one Z as something, uh, so three-dimensionally, it would be something like a cylinder with a pinched boundary, and here we would put Z on sigma I of Z. Or in the one-dimensional picture, let me represent it this way, Z1, and there is a beginning of a vertex, sigma I of Z. on the topological recursion, then means that you should multiply while well, multiplying and then taking the residue as an integral. And in all the Feynman graph representation, uh, a vertex means gluing and integrating. So, uh, so the topological recursion, so this formula here, Using this graphical representation, what does it give? It gives that omega uh, so one two to n is k times z one, and here you have your omega g minus one and plus one. So I have now two genus two, but one more boundary, and you glue them in this way. So here you had Z on sigma of Z, Z two, 
Zn plus the sum with no disks of Z1 Z sigma I of Z of something with, let's say, I1 I2 or in the two-dimensional version uh, Z1 Z2 Zn equals uh, Z1 plus sum of Z1 Okay. Let's let me show you why this is so useful. Um, in fact, when I said uh, when I talked about the proof of how you prove the symmetry of uh, omega g n and all that, using the graphical representation is extremely helpful. In fact, you mostly prove the things graphically. And, uh, and let me show you examples now. Omega one one of z one, as I said, is the residue of k of z one z. Uh, omega zero two of z and sigma i of z. Uh, z goes to a, sum over a. Okay, so in my picture, this means that z one equals z one, and here you glue a cylinder z and sigma i of z. Okay, or in the or in this other picture, it means that Z one is this graph. Let me represent omega zero three of Z one, Z two, Z three. Let me use uh, more of uh, this. Uh, dimensional representation z1 z2 z3 equals so you have z1 and here you should glue something and while the g minus 1 and plus 1 since z equals 0 this term is not there there is no g minus 1 g equals minus 1 and in the sum here uh, in the sum here you can find that the only possible things would be to glue an omega 0 2 of z z two on an omega zero two of z z three of a sigma of z z three plus uh, and you can exchange the two z three and z two okay so far it's kind of trivial. Let's see when it starts being more interesting. Let's compute omega one two of z one z two. So which is in my picture this and let's apply the recursion formula. So we have Z1, Z, and what can we do? We had the omega G minus one and plus two uh, and plus one, so which was an omega zero three. We have an omega zero three. And the omega zero three uh, will be this guy uh, with Z2 plus and uh, so in the sum, we had, uh, what can we have? Uh, Z1, we can glue 
two things here and there. The sum of this genus has to be one, and the sum of the number of external legs has to be one. So it means that one of the two sides has genus one, the other side has genus zero. One of the two sides has an external leg, the other side has no external leg. The genus zero term um, must have, if it would have no external leg, it would be an omega zero one. I mean, no external leg except this one. I mean, one more external leg. If we have only this one on genus zero, it would be an omega zero one. It would be a disk. You don't want that. So the only possibility is that when it's genus zero, it must be an omega zero two. And when it's genus one, it's okay. So here you can have this one plus uh, Z one and here you may have the genus one on that side and the omega zero two on that side. Okay, so this is just saying that this is the residue at A of Ka of Z one Z times this term is an omega zero three of Z sigma A of Z Z two plus uh, B of Z, Z2, omega 1, 1 of sigma I of Z, plus B of, uh, plus omega 1, 1 of Z, B of sigma I of Z, Z2. So, I mean, the picture upstairs is just the translation, I mean, uh, it's just uh, a graphical way of representing this equation. This equation is topological regression. Uh, why is this so useful? First, it's much easier to remember the picture than the formula. And, and then you, you retranslate. Each time you see an arrow on an edge, you put a K. Each time you see a non-arrowed edge, you put a B. And each time you see one of these blobs, you put the corresponding omega GM. But now, let's use the fact that we have already also computed the omega 0, 3 and the omega 1, 1 by the recursion. So rem remember that omega 1, 1 of Z uh, that appears here was residue at A of K, A of Z, Z prime, now it's Z prime variable, uh, of uh, B of Z prime, sigma A of Z prime. So graphically, this was Z and that. And omega zero three of Z, uh, Z2, Z3. Well, let me call it sigma of Z, Z2 was residue Z prime goes to A of K A of Z, Z prime. And there was an omega zero two of Z prime sigma A of Z, omega zero two of sigma A of Z prime uh, Z two plus omega zero two of Z prime Z two, omega zero two of sigma A of Z prime sigma A of Z. Which was surely this with uh, sigma I of z and z2 plus this uh, times z2 and sigma I of z. In fact, uh, since k is invariant and not changing z prime to sigma of z prime, in fact, these two terms have the same value. They are both equal to twice, uh, twice this one. Excuse me. Uh, yes, you're right. There is a sum over A prime. Yes, so and that will be important, by the way. Uh, uh, 
but here it's a sigma a of a prime of z prime on the sigma a of z. And indeed, they don't have to be the same because indeed, I did not write, but you have to take a sum over a. And in the sum, it's not always, I mean, it's not, the sum is not diagonal. There is no reason why the sum would be diagonal. Yes, you're right. This one is not a prime. The prime is associated to z prime, not to z. You're right. Sorry. <laughs> Good, uh, good remark. Uh, all right. So, uh, so, but now let's replace this blob here by this picture, and let's replace this blob here by uh, by this this picture or this one with a factor two. Okay. So, what do we get? We get that omega one two. So, which is that guy equals uh, in fact, let me start by these two here. So this, well, here we have the B, and here we have the omega 1, 1, which I replaced by this graph. Plus this one. So that's these two terms. On this one, remember that it's made of two terms. So we have this times. So now we want to plug, uh, yes. So the z was there and the sigma of z was there. So the z is at the beginning of the arrow. And here we plug the sigma a of z. So this one goes to z2. And the sigma a of z, let me it this way, it goes back to uh, the sigma of z plus uh, and here we had the second graph so z2 okay. I mean these two graphs, in fact, when you compute their value, they are equal. So in the end, you have two times uh, that plus two, and these two graphs also are equal. Basically, it does not matter if you if you twist here. I mean, the, the k is symmetric, so so the ordering here does not matter. So you don't have to do this crossing. You can just do it this way. So let me do it this way. Okay, so you start to see that we can repeat this procedure many times. And in general, omega gn will be a sum of graphs with typically g loops and n external legs. It's very reminiscent of what are Feynman graphs. But they are not Feynman graphs. Uh, first, you see some edges have an arrow. Some edges don't have an arrow. The number of edges that have an arrow is always, uh, so number of arrows is always the number of k, and it's always 2g minus 2 plus n. The number of uh, non arrows. Uh, the number of B is always uh, G plus N minus 1, I think. Is that right? Uh, because uh, yes, I think this is correct. The number of so the number of uh, of arrows and the number of non arrowed legs. So in the end, after you 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 do this, in the end you have no more omega gns inside. You have uh, you have only only the k on the b kernel that appear in the end. Okay, and you can repeat that. But in this procedure, since uh, so okay, and this picture is associated to a formula. Of residues. But remember what we did. Here we have a residue, 
compute there and the residue to compute there. But the result of the integrations of the residues depend in which order you do the operation. And you should always first integrate the residues. I mean, you should integrate your residues in the inverse order of the arrows. So you should compute this one first, then this one. And it just follows from what I have done. I mean, basically, uh, since here I use the formula for omega 1, 1, it means that I have already computed the residue of omega 1, 1 before computing this one. So, uh, so you should always follow the, uh, so the, the order of computing residues is always you follow the arrows backwards. Also, you can realize that in this procedure, the arrows will never make loops. The arrows can never, uh, I mean, the arrows always form a tree. Uh, and they form a tree. The arrows can never make a loop. And that's the first difference with Feynman graphs. It's a non-local constraint. Uh, another constraint is that uh, arrows can never do uh, so. And, but uh, on the contrary, the bees can make loops. So the bees typically will make a, so the bees will appear basically only in the external legs or only to make loops. So that's why you have G plus N minus one because the external legs, in fact, one of the external legs is at a K and you have N minus one external legs that are with a B. And you have G, Bs that serve to close a loop somewhere. So, I mean, in your tree, somewhere, some B has to, to, to connect uh, one vertex to another vertex of your tree. But there is a constraint in this procedure, uh, which is that it can only connect two uh, vertices that are descendant of each other along the tree. It can never connect two different branches. So, again, that's the main difference with Feynman graphs. So uh, the B uh, connect only external edges or uh, or descendant along the tree. And then, if you do that, basically, uh, if you take all the graphs that satisfy these properties, uh, in general, somehow, uh, then omega gn is just the sum of all such graphs. Omega gn of z1, zn, is the sum of all graphs g, belongs to uh, all graphs g, graphs, so with 2G minus 2 plus N uh, arrows that form a tree and rooted at Z1, uh, you have G plus N minus 1 non-arrows. and So N minus 1 arrows uh, that are uh, ending at the ZJ j equals 2 to n, and g arrows that connect uh, a vertex somewhere to another vertex somewhere, and such that they are descendant, or ancestor. I mean. If you take the sum of all such graphs, and you take uh, residue at vertices, and a product over on edges, uh, so the arrowed edges, you put a K, and the non-arrowed edges, you put a B. Well. And that's as simple as that. In fact, the way to proceed is first you find all the trees with 2G minus 2 plus N uh, arrows. Then you try to connect them with the bees in all possible ways. So this formula is extremely useful to prove theorems, in fact. And in particular, the symmetry of omega GN can be used this way, can be proved this way. Of, like, well, no, okay, there are, there are labels, uh, la with labels, with uh, labels, 
So there are two kinds of labels. Indeed, at every ramification point, I should, uh, so every, at every vertex, I should re recall the ramification point. So here, for example, we had A and A prime. Uh, and you should give names to variables that you integrate, but they are somehow, somehow they are dummy variables. You integrate them, so in the end, you, you don't have to record their names. The only names that you need are the names of external edges. Uh, so let's call that one sigma of z. This one, let's call it z prime and sigma I prime of z prime. So indeed, you should put labels. And when you put labels, uh, so the, f the fact of labeling uh, somehow, um, you could somehow remove the labels and see the factor of the powers of two, uh, the symmetry factor powers of two appearing because changing a label to its uh, conjugate will just multiply by two. Right. Um, okay. And this will be useful for something else, what I'm saying here. Okay, so now I want to go to other kinds of properties. In fact, I was hesitating to either go toward um, wave functions on flat uh, on section of flat connections and things like that, uh, or uh, to talk about the um, holomorphic anomaly equations, uh, BCOV or Hitchin, uh, Hitchin equations. Um, so how much time do I have? Okay, 10 minutes. Okay. Let me uh, now use this graphical notation to show you something. Imagine, so uh, that's uh, part uh, seven, uh, changing B. So let me uh, do, so, so far, for example, in all my example, I was using dz1, dz2 over z1 minus z2 to the square. Uh, but let's change it to uh, something like uh, something which has no pole on the diagonal and typically a, tensor, a symmetric tensor product of one forms. So some over, uh, let's say, k on L, and I take a symmetric matrix, let's call it kappa KL, and uh, um, a set of one form, omega k of z1, omega L of z2. And these forms can be anything you like. Well, if you are in higher genus, if you were in a higher genus, instead of this kernel, you would take the, let's say, Weierstrass function. Uh, and an example, so, uh, so le just let me give the example of genus one. So you have your torus, so sigma is the torus, zero, one, tau. Uh, so it is C quotiented by, so you can, so a point Z belongs to the torus, Z must be identified to Z plus one and to Z plus tau, which means that your torus is in fact quotiented by Z plus tau Z. Okay, your torus is that. And there is a, there is a well-known function, uh, it's the Weierstrass function, P of Z1 minus Z2, uh, is a function that has a double pole on the diagonal. Uh, times dz1, dz2. This is a one form, this is a one tensor one form, which is symmetric and which has a double pole on the diagonal. So it could be used as our B. But this, uh, well, and let me call this one the A cycle and this one the B cycle. Uh, B curl and A curl, okay? Or if you want, represent it like that. You have A and B. Uh, this form, when you integrate it on the A cycle, does not give zero. When you integrate it on the B cycle, either it doesn't give zero. In fact, one way to make it give zero is to add the G2 Eisenstein series. If you add G2, then it gives zero on the A cycle. Uh, but why, choose, why to choose to normalize it on the A cycle? 
you could also choose to normalize it on the base cycle. Then you should choose another value. You could also decide to normalize it on a linear combination of A and B cycles, integer combination. And in fact, why integer? You could decide to normalize it on anything you like. So which means that you can add to B uh, anything, kappa, dz1, dz2. dz1 is a one form which is holomorphic on the torus. Uh, because dz1, dz1 of z, I mean d of z1 plus 1 is equal to dz1, and d of z1 plus tau is equal to dz1. So it's a, it's a very nice candidate for uh, one form. Uh, and kappa can be completely an arbitrary number. Every choice of kappa will give something that has a double pole on the diagonal and no other pole. In higher genus, uh, there are more holomorphic forms, and typically this would be a matrix of size of the genus, a symmetric matrix. But any of them would be good, and you can choose any value of kappa and run topological recursion, and what would you get? And as, as I told you, uh, if you choose kappa equals G2, uh, then you have your B normalized on A cycle. If you choose a certain other value, you have your B normalized on a B cycle. If you have choose another, I mean, there are discrete values of kappa that correspond to normalizing on a certain integer cycle. Uh, it's a discrete set. But why restrict to a discrete set? We can do it for any, uh, for any kappa. And just run topological recursion, it will still have the property that you get something uh, symmetric. Uh, I mean, all the properties will be there. Uh, and so, what, uh, what does it mean? First, graphically, it means that you replace B. Graphically, it means that you replace your B to uh, a B plus... Okay, let me simplify the discussion and consider the case where you have only one term. Omega of Z1, omega of Z2. So let me uh, simplify, and here you see that you have something somehow that is decoupled. And let me represent it this way, Z1, kappa, Z2. Uh, okay. And let's now put that in the graphical representation here. Uh, I think the time is probably over. Uh, Okay, let me start by doing some very simple example. What, for example, how would omega 1 1 change? Well, omega 1 1 uh, in this new B would be the same as the omega 1 1 we had before. Uh, remember that K contains an omega 0 2. So when you recompute the new K, with new b, you have an extra term, so k is changed to uh, k is changed to k plus kappa times, and here you would have uh, one half of the integral of z second to z prime. Uh, sorry, sigma of z prime to z prime of uh, omega. So you would have the omega of z, but comes in factor, and here you will have the omega of z second uh, divided by omega zero one of z. Sorry, let me put this one here. Omega zero one of z minus omega zero one of sigma of z. Uh, no, sorry. It's because the formula was wrong. It was a z prime and the z prime and the z prime. And uh, on the z, no, sorry, and here, sorry. Okay. So basically, the only dependent in z is there. It's completely factorized. Okay. Uh, so, which graphically I will continue to represent as my kernel like that. 
plus kappa times, and here I will decouple uh, like that. This one is the omega of z, and this one is, uh, is this term. So somehow it's like breaking the k into two edges. And it's linear in kappa. Uh, on the B, similarly, you have here omega of Z1. So this picture means omega of Z1 times kappa times omega of Z2. And now let's put that in the here. So we have plus And each time there is a kappa in, inside, it means it's just a product. There is, no, uh, there is no interaction between the variable on the right and on the left of the kappa. So it, you can just replace that by products. And so we have now four terms. And it's, the important thing is that it's a polynomial in kappa. And the degree of the polynomial must be something like uh, 3g minus 3 plus n. Yeah, it's time. OK. Uh, but so. In the end, what I would just want to say is that you get graphically, uh, it's obvious that you get a polynomial of kappa. You can even find the degree. And uh, you, you recognize that it contains many subgraphs that are over omega gns. And I will write the formula in the, in the, in the next part. OK, thanks. Yeah, let, let's have a, yeah, we can, let's have a go.